this is Rumble, and I'm Michael Moore. Welcome to this episode, episode number 89. Is that possible? 89. And I am coming to you from my podcast studio. We have to come up with a name for the studio, by the way. Hey, another contest. Name Mike's podcast studio. You can write me with your suggestions to mike at michaelmoore.com uh, or drop me a, a voicemail on the Anchor podcast platform that this podcast appears on. It's been a, um, well, anything I would say would, would actually be an understatement because how to describe the last week, the last three weeks, the last three months. Um, do you even remember what life was like back in uh, January? <laughs> I'm trying to remember something I did in January that was, you know, part of the old normal. And now it's, it's you know, obviously people have suffered. People have died. Whether they've died from the coronavirus, whether they've died from the virus of racism, um, whether the, the number of people that have died from the coronavirus is much higher than it should have been thanks to the virus that's in the White House. I mean, we, have, we are dealing with a lot here, folks. And every day I think our heads just get, just start spinning. You're going to hear notes of optimism in me um, in this episode because um, when I am optimistic, I I have I trust it because I'm I'm so not so much of the time and so willing to accept the the shitty hand that we've been dealt on so many levels. Not accept it, but I accept that that's our reality, and now I and you will work together to change that reality. But in this case, a number of things have just have taken place in the past few days, the past couple of weeks. And um, it's, it's moved me uh, profoundly. It's very hard for me to still deal with what happened in Minneapolis. And, um, and I, know that this will not change unless we continue the uprising. I heard somebody yesterday refer to it as the Floyd Rebellion. I love that. Name it Name it after George Floyd. What's happening? Let his name live on forever. At the funeral on, on uh, Tuesday, there was a message read from the president of Ghana, a country in West Africa, a country where a lot of the slave ships came in and out of to kidnap human beings and bring them to the New World and also um, to European countries. And the message from the president of Ghana said, that um, at the memorial there, at the slavery memorial where the ships docked and then left with hundreds, then thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of African men, women, and children. So there's a huge memorial there. There's that famous photo of when Obama visited there and he's looking out the window of the what was left of the rock structure there. And they have added George Floyd's name to the wall on that slave memorial in Ghana. And while I was watching the, the funeral, um, I was, well, I'm sure if you were watching it or you heard about it later, you saw it later, very moved. But it's not, you know, we can do a lot of these symbolic things. That's a powerful one. Um, somebody suggested yesterday also that uh, George Floyd's birthday is October 14th. So October 12th is officially Columbus Day, um, but we celebrate it on the, I, I believe it's the second Monday of October, which is George uh, Floyd's birthday is always on or around the second Monday of 
October, October 14th. And somebody said, this is the perfect moment to get rid of Columbus Day. We should not be honoring someone who did what he did when he came to this new world. If you don't know it, read it. If you don't want to read about it, I'll do a whole podcast on it at some point. It's uh, it's quite a despicable legacy. He made a number of trips here to the new world and um, did some awfully evil things. Uh, we should not be having a holiday, a celebration, a memorial, a statue, anything uh, in his honor. I know Italians aren't going to like that because it's really celebrated sort of as an Italian-American holiday. Hey, I'm all for Italian-Americans and having an Italian-American day. Let's pick somebody um, who is somebody we want our children to um, look up to and think of this whatever the italian american is but but why don't we just switch out right now columbus day for george floyd day and george floyd will come to represent millions of people who've had to suffer during the 401 years since the first slave ship landed in virginia what a great day to teach our children to honor to respect to remember, to think about how we white people have benefited from a system that got set up so that we would always be ahead. We'd always be a few steps, a few feet, a few miles ahead simply because of what got passed down. It's an idea. On the day of the funeral that night, on Tuesday night, Within about two or three hours, it seemed like these uh, news flashes kept popping up on my phone. And with literally within, and you probably, they popped up on your phone too. Within a few hours, uh, this, this is what came, came up on the phone. Um, number one, Paramount Television announced that they were eliminating cops. They were taking cops off TV cop you know like show cops and um i've always felt this was a very racist show uh watching mostly white cops chase down mostly black men and rip their shirts off a knee to the back a knee to the neck a knee somewhere they knew the cameras were on them so at least back then unlike the cop in minneapolis who just looked right into the lens of the camera and went yeah, so, what, what's your problem? This is what we do. But, but, you know, a decade ago, they were mostly cognizant. This is a Fox television, Fox network, not Fox News. Fox network show. If you, I mean, it's been on for like 30 years, and then I know it's all over the place. It's been everywhere. And as of Tuesday, that was the end of it. Boom, gone. Thank God. Then HBO announced that they were no longer going to make Gone with the Wind um, available on their on-demand movies. Gone. Now, look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a person. As you know, I've been through this uh, here with our film um, this, uh, the last month or so. Um, I believe people should have the right to see these things. I think you should watch uh, the racist stuff so you understand how we got to where we're at. You should watch Birth of a Nation. It's a racist film by one of the great early directors, D.W. Griffith, and um, and Gone with the Wind. Um, but you know what they're going to have to do now? They're going to. You're not going to see. This is where it's going to go really crazy because the way films were made, even the great film Casablanca, the black character, the piano player. You're just a little uncomfortable, aren't you, watching that? Yeah, doesn't feel right. Oh, they all, they, for, for being 1942, yeah, they're farther ahead than the way they were showing other uh, black people, black actors in Hollywood. But nah, not really, not really. But that announcement came out on Tuesday night. Then, then the Merriam-Webster Dictionary announced that uh, due to a complaint 
from a woman in, I don't know where, Indiana, North Carolina, somebody. So a woman just wrote to Merriam Webster Dictionary saying, I don't like your definition of racism. It's not right. It's you're, you're pulling the punch out of it. You need to be honest and just say what racism is in your dictionary definition. And Webster Dictionary, they, they thought about it for some time before now. They've been thinking about it since she wrote them. And they decided she's right, that they need to be more specific in their dictionary definition of racism. And they announced on Tuesday that that's what they're going to do in the next edition of, of the dictionary Racism's definition will be more honest. Wow. And then, I don't know, another hour later, it come, the thing comes up on the phone that NASCAR, NASCAR, okay? NASCAR has announced there will be no more Confederate flags flown or displayed or put on cars in any of the official NASCAR races or um, tracks where they run uh, the car races. Okay, I don't need to tell you. And listen, you know, I, 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 friends of mine actually are big NASCAR fans. So not everybody who, who likes NASCAR uh, is, um, you know, a Southern dude with, you know, issues. Um. So let, let, let's. I don't want to paint the brush across across that because I happen to know that that's not true. There are just guys and some women who love to watch cars go around track very fast and try to outrun the other cars without crashing into them and killing yourself. Sadly, I'm afraid too many of the spectators are there waiting for the spectacle of the crash. I hate to say it, but I think that's true for a certain number of them. NASCAR, though, NASCAR, mostly, there's NASCAR races all over the country, but it really is a Southern-based sport. Call it a sport, right? Yeah, sport. No more Confederate flags. <laughs> wow. What is next? What is the next thing we're going to hear? I wrote that to a family member today. Like, what is the next thing? And I said, oh, I know, um, a Black Lives Matter march through the neighborhood where we grew up, where we grew up in this all-white section of Genesee County there in Flint. <laughs> and I just waited a second because I already knew what I was going to say. And then I just text, the next text was, oops, uh, too late. Last Saturday, young people in this school district in the Davison school district um, marched right down the main street, right in front of the house we grew up in. I got to tell you someday I'll do a, I'll do a podcast on growing up in that particular little town neighborhood, whatever. Um, let's just say, uh, well, let me put it. I'll give you an, here's a quick, quick story. So tomorrow's the anniversary of the day that I was elected to the Board of Education. I was elected when I was 18 years old. I was the first 18-year-old elected in the state of Michigan when the voting age had just been dropped from 21 to 18 that year. I ran for a school board. I won. I, you know, uh, if you saw my Broadway play, there's a big scene in it, uh, with that. Uh, if not, I wrote about it in my book, uh, Here Comes Trouble. Um, Otherwise, I'll just, I'll do a podcast on it someday. But anyway, so I won. And um, and in the first year or so, when I was on the school board, we had a new elementary school that came about. And we needed a name for it, like who to name it after. And I made a motion that we name it after Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I, if you'd missed the first part of this podcast, the, I, the district, school district I was in the, uh, was an all-white district. It might have been five uh, black families. Um, that's it. And, uh, and so this is an all white elementary school. And I was proposing we name it after Martin Luther King Jr. Because where do you see that, right? It's never, you know, it's just, it doesn't, doesn't happen. So 
Oh my God, the shit hit the fan and a recall campaign was started. They got the signatures. It's a long story, but the end of the story is they held an election to remove me from the board because I was going to name, I wanted to name this elementary school after Martin Luther King Jr. And I won. I won the recall. I was not removed, but I won just by a few votes. But um, so the issue of race in the town, I've talked on this podcast before, coming out of church the night that Martin Luther King was assassinated and some dad had gone out early, turned his car on, turned the radio on, the news was on, he jumped up on his floorboard above the the you know the tops of all the cars to shout out to us as we were coming out of church. They just killed Martin Luther King. And a cheer went up. Not not by everybody, but enough to where I as a eighth grader was very disturbed by what I just uh, witnessed. That's where I grew up. So if you just so you understand, a Black Lives Matter march down through the main street of of this town, this school district. If you grew up in a place like that, you know that if you were to hear that about your neighborhood, your town, whatever, and that the young people had done this, um, wow, it would, it would hit you like a frying pan in the face because you never in a thousand years would have expected that. And yet there it was. There it was. Wow. My sisters and I, we were just we were reading the story and we we're just so like, wow. That old cliche, it gets better. Hang in there. Things get better. Not always. But, you know, it does. Sometimes. Sometimes, a lot of times. And sometimes never. But right now, right now, my friends, we're in a moment. We are in a moment, and we need to seize this moment. Everybody needs to get on board. And, of course, it's not like that in everybody's town. A couple days ago, in Franklin Township, New Jersey, New Jersey, okay, again, some young people decided to have a march through their little town, their little school district, and they were marching down the the road, the street, whatever, and in a group of adults had gathered in somebody's front yard, put up a whole bunch of Trump signs, put up a big sign that said, all lives matter, and then three of the men, grown men, three of the men, right there on uh, out on the lawn, so all the kids could see it, reenacted the murder of George Floyd with shit-eating grins on their faces, yucking it up. Literally, these are three adult men, um, uh, someone playing George Floyd um, on the ground, the other guy with his knee on his neck, or right near his neck on his back. I couldn't see that clearly on the, the videotape. But, you know, the idea was to have it on his knee. I mean, the knee was on the neck. And then the other one just shouting at the kids, shouting at them, using racist language. And it turned out one of these three guys was a senior uh, prison guard at one of, in one of New Jersey's prisons, like one of the top guys. Well, he's been suspended. But who would do such a thing? This is, this is the backlash that I think some of us know is going to be coming. And Trump will stir the pot, I think, as, as much as he can. All the footage of violence against protesters over these last couple of weeks. Have you seen any compilation of these? If you haven't, or somebody has one, just again, send it to me and I'll, I'll post it on, on my platform here. Uh, just send it to me at mike at michaelmore.com. Um, you need to see, this is this was much worse than I had heard or had thought was going on in town after town. The violence, the violent, vicious violence on the part of police. It's not just pushing down the 75-year-old. Um, you, you know, by the way, um, uh, I said the other day, I called him an old, an old man. It's not true. It's, I mean, he, he's, he's fit. He's, he's hopefully he's going to be fine. He's still in the hospital, but, um, um, 75 is the new 55. Let me just, I'll say that to, 
to the people in their 70s who are listening, and let's just move on from that, okay? Um, but no, seriously, though, the violence against the protesters, you must go online, type it in, look at it. It's stunning. The police have not gotten the message, and that's why defund the police is the, is the new the new catchphrase coming out of everybody's mouth because that's what we need to do. And Trump and the Republicans will try to use it to mean like, yeah, we just want to, well, we just all want to run free in our anarchy with no cops around. It, what it means, defund the police, it means that we need to rethink how we police ourselves. And is this the way that we really want to do it? Is this the best way? Is this the safest way? And is it really fair to the cops that they get these calls and they're expected to be mental health workers. <laughs> you know, they're they're expected to uh, to be drug and alcohol addiction specialists. They're su- they're supposed to know how to defuse a potentially violent situation. Well, they should know that. The re- the real you know the serious crimes that you want to be have protection from murder, rape, robbery. Assault, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yes, but we send the police out to do things they're not qualified to do, and I don't think they want to do them, and they shouldn't do them. We need to rethink the idea of 911. Just like you call 911 when you have a fire, you don't send the cops. If you got a grease fire in the kitchen, send me the police. No. You know, if you call 911 because your husband's had a heart attack, and all of a sudden, you open the door and it's a cop. I don't want a cop. I want the EMT guys. I want the ones with the paddles and the, those electric things they put on the chest and, and out in the ambulance to revive him. I don't want a cop. Well, there's all these other things that we call cops for. And I think there was a, there was a cop on one of the cable news shows yesterday saying that the, the honest truth is, is that 90% of our work is not murder, rape, armed robbery, grand theft auto. It's, it's a drug addict who's behaving in a way where he or she needs help. You know, it's somebody who's drunk, an alcoholic. It's it's somebody who has a mental issue. It it's it's not somebody who needs a cop. So what if each city had different divisions. So, the, okay, the 911 operator gets the call, describe to me what's happening, and then they, they know, oh, yeah, if it's a fire, I send the fire truck. If it's somebody that needs an ambulance, I send the ambulance. And if it's somebody who's lost their mind, we'll send in the mental health squad, the response squad. You know, if it's if it's a drug or alcohol issue, it's, that means it's a health issue. It's not a crime issue. What if we thought of it that way? What if we went back to the idea that they're supposed to be peace officers? Not cops dressed up like they're going to Afghanistan. Jesus. How did we let this happen? We did let this happen. We, we, we've let so much happen. Well, we can stop it. If NASCAR can take the Confederate flag down, my friends, do I need to finish the sentence? Come on. Come on. And you can do this in your town. Talk to your mayor, talk to your city council people, talk to your county commissions, whatever kind of government you have, talk to them and tell them and organize your neighbors and your friends and the people you go to church with, and especially the white people, do this. Don't just say black lives matter. Let's start acting like it. I'm, I'm so, I don't know. Can I just talk to the white people here for a minute? How you doing? How you feeling about us? I know we got all our rationalizations and our defenses and our, I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm a good person. I vote the right way. I stand up for black America. I give money. I know. I'm not, don't mean to mock that. I'm, I'm just saying whatever we've been doing to try and make it better in this in this racist country that we live in it hasn't worked has it and just like jeff and ozzy and i have said in this film to the grand poobahs of the environmental movement you know whatever you've been doing it hasn't worked just admit it then we can come up with a new plan don't attack us for pointing out the truth 
well, that's what I want to say to us, to us white people here. Let's, let's not be afraid of the truth. Whatever it is we think that we've been doing for the last umpteen years, it hasn't worked. So what can we do? And I don't mean just what can we do regarding the police. What can we do to really fix this? To fix the scourge of the 401 years? We can do this. But I think it's going to take some real outside-of-the-box thinking. I think we've got to think of things and we've got to say things that we're afraid to say to other white people. Like, we have to refuse to, to participate in a society that, you know, we don't think of it as white supremacy, but it is. I saw this thing on Instagram yesterday of... It was a list of all the different things, whether it was jobs in our society or whether it's political office or, um, you know, who decides what TV shows gets on, get on TV, who decides what gets in the media, who runs, you know, all of this. And you go down the list and it's 90% white, 95% white, 100% white over and over and over again. I know that with just my own, my own unions that I uh, belong to. Um, the Writers Guild, SAG, Directors Guild. These are very majority white uh, institutions. And, um, and while they um, may have certain people of color, what you don't see are a lot of black people making movies, writing movies, producing movies. So in that sense, because this is what I do, that's a business I work in, I'm culpable for this. And I can tell you how I've, I don't, you know, I hire black people, I do all, yes, of course, yes. But, but the institution that I'm part of, whether it wants to think of itself as, as white supremacy, what do you call it when 90 to 95 percent of your union members are white or or there are literally no black individuals you can go you can go to movie sets you can go to tv sets you can go to places and it's stunning you don't see any black people and then you'll see the occasional person bringing somebody coffee what are we going to do about this each of us we're not going to solve it on on today's podcast. I want to I want to get into a couple of other things here be, um, before we finish up. But I just I'm telling you, my friends, my white friends, um, all of us must do something something of substance and meaning. But I also know where I come from, and I know, and I I come from the working class, and so I come from people, white people, in Flint, Michigan, who don't have a lot of money, who are not people that hold any economic power that, that that where they could make life miserable for black people. So so there's the class part of this that must always be discussed when we're talking like this. Who's got the dough? How'd they get it? And how much of it can we take from them to spread it around so that things are better for everyone? Let's start the discussion. That's all I'm trying to do here. You know, when you brainstorm, you don't you don't judge the ideas. You just start spewing the ideas out, and somewhere a genius idea will will happen. You're thinking right now, aren't you? Right? Please join me. I'll join you. Send your ideas. Send a voicemail to this podcast. Tell me your ideas. I'll share them with the other people who are listening to this. We passed the 11 million mark of, of listeners, of downloads of, of this podcast here um, over last weekend. Thank you. Seems like we just hit 10 million a week or so ago. So we've, we found the 10 millionth. We've got our 10 millionth uh, listener. And um, that person and our 5 millionth listener are going to join us on a podcast here very soon so we'll get to talk uh, to them um, about being 
such historic listeners uh, to this podcast. So um, that'll be coming. That'll be coming shortly. Uh, before I, I um, conclude with uh, just a couple of other things, I want to say some important uh, things here on, on this podcast. I want to um, welcome another underwriter uh, to this uh, episode. Uh, they just started with us uh, last month. Uh, and they have underwritten a few shows, and they're underwriting this episode. So first of all, I want to thank them, um, Express VPN. Now, VPN, in case you don't know, stands for Virtual Private Network. Uh, it's something that, that well, my crew, we used it um, on our last film we're making. Now, here's why, let me tell you why we were using it. Um, and, and you need to know, you don't need to be a filmmaker or a journalist or, you know, it's, it's you just have to be somebody that you where you want to protect your online privacy. We should, we should all be able to use the web without having to worry about this. And yet our internet service providers, they track everything that we search and then they use that information. They sell it. That's how they make money, but they're digging into our closet to find out, you know, what we're looking up. Now, some of you are a little more you know, younger people, are more adept at how to try to trick the system you know, well, you think, how, how about if I just use incognito mode to protect my privacy? Well, I, I have to tell you, in, incognito mode does not hide your activity on the Internet. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your Internet service provider can see every single website you've ever visited. And that's why um, whether you're you know at work or you're at home or whatever, um, you should be using what we use, and that's a, this thing called ExpressVPN. Um, so think about this now. And it, again, it doesn't matter whether you're using, you know, you've got a big name internet uh, thing like Verizon or Comcast. Um, your internet service provider, they can legally sell your information to ad advertising companies. Um, so ExpressVPN, though, it's an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites that you're visiting. ExpressVPN also it keeps all your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption uh, service available. You can have this available, this app. You can have it on your phone, your computer, uh, even on your smart TV. It's easy to use. You know, you're not going to notice that it's on. So, listen... My advice and why I'm so grateful that they've decided to underwrite uh, this podcast uh, because I believe in what they do. We've used them. It works. And, you know, the kind of stuff I'm doing in the films when we're making these films, we we can't have people knowing what we're doing. We can't have people hacking in and trying to get that stuff. And we can't have, you know, Verizon selling our information to people. So protect your online activity. Uh, it's rated number one by CNET and Wired Magazine. And if you visit our exclusive link to, to Rumble here, to our podcast, if you visit that, you'll get a three extra months free uh, on a, on a one-year package. And also you'll be helping the show because they are helping to underwrite us and my voice so it can be heard by people. So I'm grateful for them to doing that. Just go to expressvpn.com and then slash Rumble. And then you get the three months free. Thanks again uh, to ExpressVPN for being our underwriter. Now I want to uh, just close up here with uh, going over just a few other things that are out there. We uh, we passed the um, 2 million COVID-19 cases in the United States. We passed that mark last night. 2 million, 2 million COVID-19 cases in the United States of America. Wow. That's amazing. But, you know, I saw this Berkeley professor on uh, MSNBC the other night, and he was saying, you know, it's, yes, that's bad. It could have been prevented. We all could have done better. Uh, the governors, the mayors could have started the safety procedures sooner. But um, the fact that we're at 2 million, he said, if we hadn't done these things, if we hadn't stayed inside, if we hadn't stayed home, if we hadn't protected our our frontline workers eventually got them the protection that they needed um you know if we if we haven't been wearing face masks like we still are using hand sanitizer keeping your hands off your face 
protection for your eyes, all these things. He said, this is amazing that with, with in, like almost at a moment's notice, 330 million Americans decided to join in and support each other. Well, okay, not all 330 million. Almost 300 million. Let's, there's a good 30 million out there that didn't give a rat's ass and don't believe in the science and think it's a conspiracy. And they believe this guy who calls himself the president. But the vast, vast majority of us have done this. And, and he said, somebody should thank everybody, or we should all thank each other. And it's not over. We got a long ways to go here. This is a two to three year pandemic. If we do it even better, and I know like there's 20 states now where the hospitalizations are increasing, and I don't know what to say to them, but in the places where they're being more careful, those states look like New Zealand. Those states look like Iceland. Those states look like the smart countries that where everybody decided to follow along what needed to be done to save lives. But this, this professor from Berkeley was saying that we've done actually in our own kind of half-ass, full-ass way, we've done enough. We've done good. We haven't just put ourselves first. We've thought about other people. And in doing so, he said, had we done nothing? That 2 million number that we're at today of COVID cases, he said it would be closer to 60 million would have been infected in the last four months. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen because people were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to put up with whatever they had to put up with. Um, some people got to stay home. Some people got to work from home. But a lot of people had to work from midnight to 7 a.m. stocking grocery shelves. Somebody had to mop the hospital. Somebody had to run the bus or the train to get the emergency workers to their jobs. So many people put their lives at risk. Many did die. Many got really sick but lived. But most people were willing to say, yes, I'll do this. And in places like <laughs> New York, once people saw just how serious it was, it's hard to get, I mean, people in New York are individuals, free thinkers, not uh, willing to go along with just because everybody else is doing something. And yet that's what everybody did. Not everybody, I know, but enough enough and you know what new york got hit the hardest and and i don't know what the what the death rate is now in new york 60,000 somewhere around there it wouldn't have been 60,000 had the mayor and the governor acted more quickly even and cuomo has said this he he wished he could go back he wished he could go back now, knowing what he knows now, they were too slow. California did it, I think, about a week ahead of New York, and a lot less people have died. And San Francisco, the mayor of San Francisco, did it before the governor in California. And in San Francisco, I mean, what was it up through the first? Only eight people died in San Francisco the first month, and I think it's, it's somewhere close to 30, 30 or 40, over 40 now. But that's San Francisco. That's a whole compared to other cities where hundreds and thousands have died. That's amazing. Well, it's a smart city, right? With a smart mayor. And when the politician isn't worried about uh, getting reelected, they're just worried about the people. That's what happens. Just a few people die because they take action immediately. And um, they waited around too long in New York, Michigan, didn't shut down till another five days or so after New York shut down. Might have been a week. Too late. That's why Michigan at the beginning had so many cases. It was up so high because the governor wouldn't, you know, didn't. The Michigan Chamber of Commerce came out very strongly against her. No, you can't close the state down. And, and I don't know if she was listening to them or whatever, but it didn't happen. People died that didn't need to die. Sorry to say that, you know, she's great. Lover, voted for, 
But you know me, I'm, I'm just going to say it like it is. Trump attacking her right and left. Boy, he's going to get his comeuppance, right, folks? It's going to happen. But I'm telling you, that fence he has built, fences around the White House, you can see what he's preparing for. The end. His end. The end of his administration. It's coming. He knows it. And he's not going to leave. First, he's going to find a way to postpone the election. I'm telling you that right now. Don't even think that that isn't even a possibility. Because we're probably going to get the second wave of this virus. And it's probably going to happen in the fall. And he's going to use that as an excuse to postpone the election. His idea of postponing means he will never intend to have the election. Because we'll always be in crisis. We'll always be under threat. That's how they funded Homeland Security for all these years after 9-11. Have we had another 9-11 in these 19 years? It's not something that happens every day, every month, every year. But they got billions and billions and billions of dollars to spend because we're afraid. You know what you need for Homeland Security? A few smart people who have their eye on the ball, who pay attention. The only reason we had 9-11 is because George W. Bush was handed a report on August 9th, one month before 9-11, that told him that bin Laden was planning to attack the United States, probably using airplanes. He's on vacation, though, Texas. He didn't want to be bothered with it. He went fishing that day. And we're all so surprised when something happens, when, you know, you're told that it was going to happen. Why did you even stay in... Where's your shame? Why did you stay in the White House? When you resign? I know everybody likes Bush now because he's against Trump. Oh, man. But listen, this is serious. We need to continue this discussion. I need you to think about it. What are we going to do? He was doing a dry run this past week there in Washington, D.C. to see if he could call the military in to do a domestic job, which they are prohibited from doing by the laws of this country. He was trying to see if he could get away with it. He didn't. Doesn't mean he won't try it again. Now he knows where the weaknesses are and what he tried to pull off. Do not sell him short. He is an evil genius. He knows what he's doing. He didn't get this far by being just a complete idiot. He's good for a laugh, I know. This isn't funny anymore. His intention is to destroy our democracy. And what you saw with those polls that the the election in Georgia this week, in Iowa last week, in Iowa, it actually, it worked really well because they did mostly mail-in ballots and they had the largest turnout ever at a primary. And when the Republicans in Iowa saw that, they want to demolish the system that they just used for their primary for the general election in November. Because as Trump has said, the more people vote, the more Republicans lose. That's what he said. It's the truth. He knows that. So, it's it's up to us at this point. And um, we're not going to come up with the answers tonight. But we are going to, um, we're going to have a discussion, you and I and others. And I'll have people on the, on the podcast here and we'll, we'll figure out what it is we're going to do. But we are, we do not have much time. I mean, this has to happen now. Finally, thank you to all the people that have um, watched Planet of the Humans for the first time. As we said a few days ago, we finally won. We're back up on YouTube. Um, and uh, they, uh, we had a temporary one put up for a few days. Uh, I think the first three days, we had close to 200,000 people that watched uh, the film. We had all these other people who came forward and said, we'll post it on our site. So we've got over 300 sites carrying the film now around the world. And I want to thank all of you who are, who have posted it, who shared it on your Facebook, just get it out there. Don't ever let them shut us or anybody else down again. And I know I keep promising a podcast. We're going to get into, we're going to tell you how this was done so we can make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else again. And we're going to have to go after some of our, some of our fellow, what they call, they call themselves liberals. 
They aren't. They aren't at all. We'll get into this in the upcoming uh, week or two here. Um, but in the meantime, um, stay safe. Be well. Tell your friends about Planet of the Humans. You can get it on, watch it for free on my YouTube channel. It's uh, It's been called one of the most important films of the year. And it's certainly one of the most important environmental films ever made uh, by a group of people that care desperately about our planet and know that the way that we've been going and the way that we've allowed other people to run our movement and to get into bed with Wall Street and to have us putting all our eggs in one basket it is causing the ruin of this planet. And, and we don't even know now if we have time left to fix it. I want to believe we do. That's why Jeff and Ozzy and I, we made this movie uh, to ring a, a warning bell, to, to, to let the siren go, to tell people this isn't working. Go, go watch it, please, and tell others to watch it. Share it with people. It's free. And um, I'll be back here uh, in a couple of days with the, with the next podcast. But you know what your homework is here. Um, white people, you need to think about what we're seriously going to do to fix the bigger problem. Not symbolic gestures, real things. We will not live in a world like this anymore. End of story. Um, number two, um, think about the strategy that we've got to put together to make sure that Trump does not take our election away from us. Don't think he can't. Don't think he won't. He's counting on our inaction. Most importantly, he's counting on our distraction with everything else going on. And he's counting on our fear to manipulate our fear. We must not let this happen. You know it. I know it. There's more of us than there are of them. Come on. Don't be afraid. And I'm going to post on the, on the podcast here my version of Cops. 18 years ago, I went and met with a producer of the Cops TV show because I was just so disturbed by its racist kind of imagery. And um, he was actually a decent guy, but I couldn't get him to see what I was trying to say. And so finally, I, he was a Hollywood producer. I just pitched him my idea. Like, if you were to turn Cops over to me, I would do a show. It wouldn't be called Cops. It would be called Corporate Cops. And every week, we would chase down corporate executives, CEOs, and other, you know, one percenters and people um, who own or run businesses that are just doing god-awful things to people, to neighborhoods, to the planet, whatever. And we just, we'd chase them everywhere, each show. And I'd have my own force of corporate cops. And they'd all get free donuts. So... I'm going to post that. It's it's in Bowling for Columbine. It's a scene in Bowling for Columbine. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll post that on the podcast uh, on the on the main page here wherever you're listening to me. So you uh, click on it and, and watch. It's just it's just four or five minutes, but it's uh, it's still sadly uh, uh, too relevant. But also it's 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 kind of funny too. So uh, we need a laugh right now. Check that out. Um, the cops, corporate cops on the podcast uh, platform here. And um, treat yourself well. Treat everybody around you well. Be kind. Um, tell the truth. White people, tell yourself the truth about us. We know. Come on. This has to stop. Don't participate in it anymore. All right, my friends. Be well. Thanks for listening to Rumble. Executive produced by Basil Hamden and... Our sound engineer and editor is Nick Quaz. We'll see you next time. <laughs>